Section 7 of Astounding Stories, March 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Bateman. The Soul Master by Will Smith and R.J. Robbins, Part 1. The train was slowing down for Keegan. A whistle from the locomotive ahead had warned the two alert young men in the smoker to that effect, and they arose to leave the train. Both were neatly and quietly dressed. One carried a medium-sized camera with the necessary tripod and accessory satchel. The other carried no impediments of any sort. Both were smoking cigars, evidently not of expensive variety, judging by the unaromatic atmosphere thereabouts. "'Can't see what Bland shipped us up to this one-horse dump for,' grumbled Skip Handlin, the one who carried the camera. He was the slighter of the two and perhaps half a head shorter than the other. "'Do you know anything about it?' "'Not much.' confessed the other as they alighted from the smoker. All I can tell you is that Bland sent for me early this morning, told me to get a story out of this Professor Kell and to drag you along. After we get there, you're to do as judgment dictates, but I remember that the chief was specific as regards one thing. You are to get the prof's mug. Don't forget. The old fellow may growl and show fight, but it's up to you to deliver the goods. Or, in this case, get them. Don't depend on me for help. I expect to have troubles of my own. Thus gloomed Horace Perry, star reporter for the journal. This Keegan place, Hanlon was using his eyes swiftly and comprehensively, isn't worth much. Can't see how it manages to even write a name. Some dump, all right. You said a couple mouthfuls. How's the train service, if any? Rotten. Two trains a day. The other was anything but enthusiastic. We have a nice long wait for the next one, you can bet. Now just add to that a rough reception after we reach the old lion's lair, and you get a nice idea of what Bland expects from his men. Handlin made a wry face at this. The bird who first applied the words hard-boiled to the chief's moniker knew something. You don't know the half of it, retorted Perry encouragingly. Just wait and see what a beaut of a fit he can throw for your benefit if you fail to do your stuff. And I don't mean maybe. Old man Bland owned the journal, hired and fired his crew, and did his own editing with the help of as capable an office gang as could be gotten together. It is quite possible that hard-boiled Bland demanded more from his men than any other editor ever has before or since. Nevertheless, he got results, and none of his experienced underlings ever kicked, for the pay was right. If a hapless scribe had the temerity to enter the editorial sanctum with a negative report, the almost invariable reply had been a glare in a peremptory order, Get the copy. And get it they did. If a person refused an interview, these clever fellows generally succeeded in getting their information from the next most reliable source, and it arrived in print just the same. Of such a breed was Perry. Handlin, being a more recent acquisition to the staff, was not yet especially aggressive in his work, on this account, the former took keen zest in scaring him into displaying a bit more sand. The train had disappeared around a bend, and the two reporters felt themselves marooned. Keegan, without question, was a most forlorn-looking spot. A dismal shanty, much the worse for weather, stood beside the track. In front, a few rotting planks proclaimed that once upon a time the place had boasted a real freight platform. Probably, back in some long-forgotten age, a station agent had also held forth in the rickety shanty. A sign hung on each end of the crumbling structure on which could still be deciphered the legend, Keegan. On the opposite side of the track was an old, disused sighting. The only other feature of interest thereabouts was a well-traveled country road which crossed the tracks near the shanty, wound sinuously over a rock-strewn hill, and became lost in the mazes of an upland forest. There being no signboard of any kind to indicate their destination, the two, after a moment's hesitation, started off briskly in a chance direction. The air was hot and sultry, and in the open spaces the sun beat down mercilessly upon the two hapless ones. As they proceeded into the depths of the forest, they were shielded somewhat from the worst of the heat. Gradually upon their city-bred nostrils there stole the odor of conifers, accompanied by a myriad of other forest odors. Both sniffed the air appreciatively. This sure is the life, remarked Perry, if I weren't so darn thirsty now. He became lost in mournful thought. A considerable time passed. The newspaper men trudged wearily along until finally another bend brought them to the beginning of a steep descent. The forest had thinned out to nothing. Seems to me I smell smoke, blurted out Hanlon suddenly. Must be that we are approaching the old party's lair. Remember, Bland said that he- Uh-huh, the other grunted almost inaudibly. 
Now that they seemed to be arriving at their destination, something had occurred to him. He had fished from his pocket a chef of clippings and was perusing them intently. Bland said, get the copy, he muttered irrelevantly and half to himself. The clippings all related directly to Professor Kell or to happenings local to Keegan. Some were of peculiar interest. The first one was headlined thus. Mysterious Disappearance of Robert Mannion and Daughter Still Unsolved. The piece contained a description of the missing man, a fairly prosperous banker who had been seen four days previously driving through Keegan in a small roadster, and one of the girl who was in the car with him. It told that the banker and his daughter were last seen by a farmer named Willits who lived in a shack on the East Keegan Road, fleeing before a bad thunderstorm. He believed the pair were trying to make the Kell Mansion ahead of the rain. Nothing more of the Mannions or their car had been seen, and their personal effects remained at their hotel in a nearby village unclaimed. The heavy rain had, of course, effectually obliterated all wheel tracks. Another clipping was fairly lengthy, but Perry glanced only at the headlines. Kell still carrying on his strange experiments. Has long been known to have fantastic theories. Refuses to divulge exact methods employed or nature of results. Still another appeared to be an excerpt from an article in an agricultural paper. It read, A prize bull belonging to Alton Shepard, a Keegan cattle breeder, has created considerable sensation by running amuck in a most peculiar manner. While seemingly more intelligent than heretofore, it has developed characteristics known to be utterly alien to this type of animal. Perhaps the most noteworthy feature of the case is the refusal of the animal to eat its accustomed food. Instead, it now consumes enormous quantities of meat. The terrific bellow of the animal's voice has also undergone a marked change, now resembling nothing earthly, although some have remarked that it could be likened to the bay of an enormous hound. Some of its later actions have seemingly added further canine attributes, which make the matter all the more mystifying. Veterinaries are asking why this animal should chase automobiles and why it should carry bones in its mouth and try to bury them. The last one read in part, Professor Kell has been questioned by authorities at Keegan relative to the disappearance there last Tuesday of Robert Mannion and his daughter. Kell seemed unable to furnish clues of any value, but officials are not entirely satisfied with the man's attitude toward the questions. Somewhat bewildered by these apparently unrelated items, the reporter remained lost in thought for quite a space, the while he endeavored to map out his course of action when he should meet the redoubtable professor. That many of the weird occurrences could be traced in some way to the latter's door had evidently occurred to Bland. Furthermore, the old man relied implicitly upon Perry to get results. It must be said that for once the star reporter was not overly enthusiastic with the assignment. Certain rumors aside from the clippings in his hand had produced in his mind a feeling of uneasiness. So far as his personal preference was concerned, he would have been well satisfied if some cub reporter had been given the job. Try as he would, however, he could offer no tangible reason for the sudden wariness. He was aroused from his absorption by his companion. Thought I smelled smoke a while back, and I was right. That's the house up in the edge of the pines. Deep grounds in front and all gone to seed. Fits the description exactly. Thank heaven we struck off from the station in the right direction. This stroll's been long enough. Come out of it and let's get this job finished. Suiting the action to the words, Handlin started off at a brisk pace down the hill, followed at a more moderate rate by Perry. At length they came within full sight of the grounds, extending for a considerable distance before them and enclosing a large tract of land now well covered with lush grass was a formidable-looking wall. In former days a glorious mantle of ivy had covered the rough stones, but now there was little left, and what there was looked pitifully decrepit. They continued their progress along this barrier, finally coming upon a huge iron gate now much the worse for rust. It stood wide open. The road up to the house had long since become overgrown with rank grass and weeds. Faintly traceable through the mass of green could be seen a rough footpath which the two followed carefully. They met no one. As they approached the night of black pines, the mass of the old mansion began to loom up before them, grim and forbidding. Instinctively both shivered. The silence of the place was complete and of an uncannily tangible quality. Nervously, they looked about them. How do you like it, Skip? The words from Perry's previously silent lips broke upon the stillness like a thunderclap. The other started. I should hate to die in it, Handlin answered solemnly. I'll bet the old joint is haunted. Nobody but a lunatic would ever live in it. I get a good deal the same impression myself, said Perry. I don't wonder that Bland sent two of us to cover the job. As he spoke, he mounted a flight of steps to a tumble-down veranda. There was no sign of a doorbell on the weather-beaten portal, but an ancient knocker of bronze hanging forlornly before him seemed to suggest a means of attracting attention. 
He raised it and rapped smartly. No answer. Possessing all the attributes of the conventional reporter and a few additional ones, Perry did not allow himself to become disheartened, but merely repeated his summons, this time with more vim. Well, Horace, grinned Hanlon, it does look as if we were not so very welcome here. However, seems to me if you were to pick up that piece of dead limb and do some real knocking with it, oh, the dear professor may be deaf, you know, or maybe his skip, my boy, I don't know as we ought to go in right now after all. Do you realize it will soon be dark? To tell you the truth, Horace, I'm not stuck on this assignment either, and I feel that after dark I should like it even less somehow. But gee, the old man. Oh, I'm not thinking of quitting on the job. We don't do that on the journal. Perry smiled paternally at the photographer. Could it be he had purposely raised the other's hopes in order to chaff him some more? But I was thinking that it might be a good idea to look about the outbuildings in a bit while we have a little daylight, eh? Handlin looked disappointed, but nodded gamely. He delayed only long enough to deposit his camera and traps behind a grossly overgrown hydrangea by the steps, then, with a resigned air, declared himself ready to follow wherever the other might lead. Perry elected to explore the barn first. This was a depressing old pile, unpainted in years, with what had once been stout doors now swinging and bumping in the light breeze. As the two men drew nearer, the breeze, which seemed to sigh through the place at will, brought foul odors that told them the place was at least not tenantless. In some trepidation, they stepped inside and stood blinking in the half-darkness. Pretty Polly! Good God, what was that? Handlin whispered. He knew it was no parrot's voice. This was a far deeper sound than that, a sound louder than anything a parrot's throat could produce. It came from the direction of a ruinous stall over near a cobwebbed window. As Perry started fearfully toward this, there issued from it a curious scraping sound, followed by a fall that shook the floor and a threshing as of hooves. Now the great voice could be heard again, this time uttering what sounded strangely like oaths roared out in a foreign tongue. Yet when the newspaper men reached the stall, they found it occupied only by a large mule. The animal was lying on its side, its feet scraping feebly against the side of the stall. The heaving, foam-flecked body was a mass of hideous bruises, some of which were bleeding profusely. The creature seemed to be in the last stage of exhaustion, lying with his lips drawn back and eyes closed. Beneath it, and scattered all over the stall floor, was a thick layer of some whitish seeds. That's... why, that's sunflower seed, Horace, Handlin almost whimpered. And look, look in that crib, it's full of the same stuff. Where's the hay, Horace? Does this thing... He was interrupted by a mighty movement of the beast, a threshing that nearly blinded the men in the cloud of blood-stained seeds it raised. With something between a curse and a sob, the mule lunged at its crib as if attempting to get bodily into it. But no... It was only trying to perch on its edge. Now it had succeeded. The ungainly beast hung there a second, two, three. From its uplifted throat issued that usually innocuous phrase, a phrase now a thing of delirious horror. Pretty Polly! With a crash, the tortured creature fell to the floor to lie there gasping and moaning. Skip Handlin left that barn. Perry retained just enough wit to do what he should have done the instant he first saw the animal. He whipped out his automatic and fired one merciful shot. Then he too started for the outside. He arrived in the yard perhaps ten seconds behind Hadlin. Good heavens, Perry, gibbered Hadlin. I'm not going to stay around this place another minute. Just let me find where I left that suffering camera. That's all I ask. Easy now, Perry laid a hand on his companion's shoulder. I guess we're up against something pretty fierce here, but we're going to see it through, and you know it. So let's cut out the flight talk and go raise the professor. Handlin tried earnestly to don a look of determination. If Perry was set on staying here, the least he could do was stay with him. However, could Perry have foreseen the events which were to entangle them, he probably would have led the race to the gate. As it was, he grasped a stick and marched bravely up toward the front door. A sudden commotion behind him caused him to wheel sharply around. Simultaneously, a yell burst from Handlin. Look out, Horace! What he saw almost froze the blood in his veins. From a tumble-down coach house had issued an enormous wolfhound, which was now almost upon them, eyes flaming, fangs gleaming horribly. So unexpected was the attack that both men stood rooted in their tracks. The next moment the charging brute was upon them and had bowled Handlin off his equilibrium as if he were a child. The unfortunate photographer made a desperate attempt to prevent injury to his precious camera, which he had but a moment earlier succeeded in retrieving, and in doing so fell rather violently to the ground. Every moment he expected to feel the powerful jaws crunch his throat, and he made no effort to rise. 
For several seconds he remained thus, until he could endure the suspense no longer. He glanced around only to see Perry staring open-mouthed at the animal which had so frightened them. Apparently had forgotten the presence of the two men. Hanlon regained his feet rather awkwardly, the while keeping a watchful eye on the beast of whose uncertain temper he was by now fully aware. In an undertone he addressed his companion. What do you make of it? He wanted to know. Did the critter bite you? No. That's the queer part of it. Neither did he bite you, if you were to think it over just a minute. Just put his nose down and rammed you, head on. The photographer was flabbergasted. Involuntarily, his gaze stole again in the direction of the offending brute. What on earth? He began. Is, is he sharpening his teeth on a rock preparatory to another attack upon us? Or what the deuce is he doing? If you ask me, came astonishingly from the watchful Perry, he's eating grass. Which is my idea of something damn foolish for a perfectly normal hound genus Lupo to be- Look out! The animal, as if suddenly remembering the presence of the men, suddenly charged at them again, head down, eyes blazing. As before, it made no effort to bite. Though both men were somewhat disconcerted by the great brute, they held their ground, and when it presented the opportunity, the older reporter planted a terrific kick to the flank which sent the animal whimpering back to its shed behind. Score one, breathed Handlin. If we- At a sudden grating sound overhead, he stopped. Both turned to face the threatening muzzle of an ancient blunderbuss. Behind it was an irate countenance, nearly covered by an unclipped beard of a dirty gray color. In the eyes now glaring at them malevolently through heavily concave spectacles, they read hate unutterable. The barrel of the blunderbuss swung slightly as it covered alternately one and then the other. Both sensed that the finger even now tightening on the trigger would not hesitate unduly. Being more or less hardened to rebuffs of all kinds in the pursuance of their calling, the reporters did not hesitate in stating their purpose. What? yelled the old man. You dare to invade my grounds and disturb me at my labors for such a reason? Reporters! My scientific research work is not for publicity, sirs! And furthermore, I want it understood that I am not to be dragged away from my laboratory again for the purpose of entertaining you or any others of your ilk. Get away! Without further ado, the window was slammed down, a shutter closed on the inside, and once more the silence of the dead descended upon the spot. The two men grinned ruefully at each other, Handlin finally breaking the stillness. My idea of the world's original one-sided conversation. We simply didn't talk, and yet we're supposed to be reporters. You've got to hand it to the prof for us for the beautiful rock crusher he just handed us. You didn't think we had anything easy, did you? said Perry irritably. He'll change his tune presently when Hanlon's jaw dropped. You don't mean you're going back to take any more chances. Would you rouse him again after the way he treated us with that gun? Besides, the train. Perry bent a scathing glance at his companion. What on earth has the train to do with our getting the professor's confession of crime or whatever he has to offer? You evidently don't know Bland. Much. I deduce that a lot of my sweetness has been wasted on the desert air. Once more, let me assure you that if you propose to go back without the prof's mug on one of those plates, you might as well mail your resignation from here. Get me? The other wilted. I wonder, Perry ruminated as he stared in the direction of the shed wherein the canine monstrosity had disappeared. You suppose that you can get a snap of the old boy's mug if I can get him to the window again? If you can do that, just leave the rest to me. I've handled these crusty birds before. What say? Go as far as you like. The photographer was once more grinning as he unslung his camera and carefully adjusted a plate in place. Everything at last to his satisfaction, he gripped flash pan and bulb. I'm gonna make some racket now, said Perry grimly. If Kel shows up, work fast. He may shoot at you, but don't get excited. It's almost dark, so his aim might be poor. At this suggestion, his companion showed signs of panic, but the other affected not to notice this. There came a deafening hullabaloo as Perry beat a terrific tattoo on the ancient door. Followed a deep silence while Perry leaped back to stand in front of Skip and his camera. After perhaps a full minute's wait, he once more opened up his bombardment to jump quickly back to the camera as before. This time, he had better success. The window was again opened and the muzzle of the blunderbuss put in its appearance. Handlin stood close behind Perry as he silently swung the camera into a more favorable position for action. 
The face at the window was purple with wrath. You damn pests! Leave my grounds at once or I shall call my hound and set him upon you! And when crack, flash, click! Perry had made a sudden sideways movement as Hanlon went into action. Much obliged, Professor, said Perry politely. Your pose with that old cannon is going to be very effective from the front page. The write-up will doubtless be interesting, too. Probably the story won't be quite so accurate as it would be had you told it to us yourself, but we shall get as many of the details from the natives hereabouts as we can. Good day to you, sir. Motioning to the other, he turned on his heel and started down the driveway. It was an old trick, and for a long moment of suspense, he almost feared that it would fail. Another moment. Wait! The quavering voice of the irascible old villain had lost some of its malice. Come back here a minute. With simulated reluctance, the two slowly retraced their steps. Is there something else, sir? Perhaps. The old man hesitated as if pondering upon his words. Perhaps if you care to step in, I can be of assistance to you after all. It occurs to me that possibly I have been too abrupt with you. I'm very glad that you have decided to cooperate with us, Professor Kell answered the reporter heartily as they ascended the steps. The old man's head disappeared from the window, and shortly the sound of footsteps inside told of his approach. Finally, the oaken door swung open, and they were silently ushered into the musty-smelling hallway. Though outwardly accepting the professor's suddenly pacific attitude, Perry made up his mind to be on his guard. As they entered what had evidently been the parlor in bygone days, an oppressive, heavy odor smote their nostrils, telling of age-old carpets and of draperies allowed to decay unnoticed. On the walls hung several antique prints, a poorly executed crayon portrait of a person doubtless an ancestor of the present Kell, and one or two paintings done in oil, now badly cracked and stained. Everything gave the impression of an era long since departed, and the two men felt vaguely out of place. Their host led them to a pair of dilapidated chairs which they accepted gratefully. The ride to Keegan after a hard day's work had not tended to improve their spirits. Out of business. Perry went straight to the point, desiring to get the interview over as soon as possible. We've heard indirectly of various happenings in this vicinity which many think have some connection with your scientific experiments. Any statement you may care to make to us in regard to these happenings will be greatly appreciated by my paper. Inasmuch as what little has already been printed is probably of an erroneous nature, we believe it will be in your own best interest to give us as complete data as possible. Here he became slightly histrionic. Of course, we do not allow ourselves to take the stories told by the local inhabitants too literally, as such persons are too liable to exaggerate, but we must assume that some of these stories have partial basis in fact. Any information relative to your scientific work, incidentally, will make good copy for us also. Perry gazed steadily at the patriarch as he spoke. For a moment, a crafty expression passed over the old man's face, but as suddenly it disappeared. Evidently, he had arrived at a decision. Come with me, he wheezed. The two newspaper men exchanged swift glances, the same thought in the mind of each. Were they about to be led into a trap? If the old man's shady reputation was at all deserved, they would do well to be wary. Perry thought swiftly of the clippings he had read and of what gossip he had heard, then glanced once more in the direction of Handlin. That worthy was smiling meaningly and had already arisen to follow the professor. Reluctantly, Perry got to his feet and the three proceeded to climb a rickety stairway to the third floor. The guide turned at the head of the stairs and entered a long, dark corridor. Here the floor was covered with a thick carpet which, as they trod upon it, gave forth not the slightest sound. The hall gave upon several rooms, all dark and gloomy and giving the same dismal impression of long disuse. How could the savant endure such a depressing abode? The accumulation of dust and cobwebs in these long-forgotten chambers, the general evidence of decay, all told of possible horrors ahead. They became wary. But they were not wary enough. The uncouth figure ahead of them had stopped and was fumbling with the lock of an ancient door. Instinctively, Perry noted that it was of great thickness and of heavy oak. Now the professor had it open and was motioning for them to enter. Handlin started forward eagerly, but hurriedly drew back as he felt the grip of the other reporter's hand on his arm. Get back, you fool! The words were hissed into the ear of the incautious one. Then, to the professor, Perry observed, If you have no objection, we would prefer that you precede us. A look of insane fury leapt to the face of the old man, lingered but an instant, and was gone. Though the expression was but momentary, both men had seen, and seeing had realized their danger. 
They followed him into the chamber, which was soon illumined fitfully by a smoky kerosene lamp. Both took a rapid survey of the place. Conceivably, it might have been the scene of scientific experiments, but its aspect surely belied such a supposition. The average imagination would instantly pronounce it the abode of a maniac or the lair of an alchemist. Again, that it might be the laboratory of an extremely slovenly veterinary was suggested by the several filthy cages to be seen resting against the wall. All of these were unoccupied except one in a dark corner, from which issued a sound of contented purring, evidently telling of some well-satisfied cat. The air was close and foul, being heavy with the odor of musty, decaying drugs. In every possible niche and cranny, the omnipresent dust had settled in a uniform sheen of gray which showed but few signs of recent disturbance. Here, gentlemen, their host was saying, is where I carry on my work. It is rather gloomy here after dark, but then I do not spend much time here during the night. I have dedicated to acquaint you with some of the details of one or two of my experiments. Doubtless you will find them interesting. While speaking, he had, mechanically, it seemed, reached for a glass humidor in which were perhaps a dozen cigars. Silently, he selected one and extended the rest to the two visitors. After all three had puffed for a moment at the weeds, the old man began to talk, rapidly, it seemed to them. Perry from time to time took notes as the old man proceeded, an expression of utter amazement gradually overspreading his face. Handlin pulled away contentedly at his cigar, and on his features there grew an almost ludicrous expression of well-being. Was the simple photographer so completely at ease that he had at length forsaken all thought of possible danger? As Professor Kell talked on, he seemed to warm to his subject. At the end of five minutes, he began uncovering a peculiar apparatus which had rested beneath the massive old table before which they were sitting. The two men caught the flash of light on glass and a jumble of coiled wires became visible. Was the air in the laboratory getting unbearably close? Or was the queer leaden feeling that had taken possession of Perry's lungs but an indication of his overpowering weariness? He felt a steadily increasing irritation, as if for some strange reason he suddenly resented the words of their host, which seemed to be pouring out in an endless stream. The cigar had, paradoxically, an oddly soothing quality, and he puffed away in silence. Why had the room suddenly taken on so hazy an aspect? Why did Handlin grin in that idiotic manner? And the professor... He was getting farther and farther away. That perfecto... Or was it an El Cabajo? What was the old archfiend doing to him anyhow? Why was he laughing and leering at them so horribly? Confound it all. That cigar... Where was it? Just one more puff. Blindly, he groped for the missing weed, becoming aware of a cackle of amusement nearby. Professor Kell was standing near the spot where he had fallen and now began prodding him contemptuously with his toe. Fools, he was saying. You thought to interfere with my program, but you are in my power and you have no hope of escape. I am unexpectedly provided with more subjects for my experiments. You will... His words became hazy and unintelligible, for the hapless reporter was drifting off into a numb oblivion. He had long since lost the power to move a muscle. Out of the corner of an eye, just before he lost consciousness altogether, he perceived Handlin lying upon the floor still puffing at the fateful drugged cigar. Eons passed. To the reporter came a vision of a throbbing, glaring inferno, wherein he was shaken and tossed by terrific forces. His very vital essence seemed to respond to a mighty vibration. Now he was but a part of some terrific chaos. Dimly he became aware of another being with whom he must contend. Now he was in a death struggle, and to his horror he found himself being slowly but surely overpowered. A demoniac grin played upon the features of the other as he forced the reporter to his knees. It was Handlin! Once more he was sinking into soft oblivion, the while a horrid miasma assailed his nostrils. He was nothing. Slowly and with infinite effort, Perry felt himself returning to consciousness, though he had no clear conception of his surroundings. His brain was as yet but a whirling vortex of confused sounds, colors, and, yes, odors. A temporary rift came in the mental cloud which fettered his faculties, and things began to take definite shape. He became aware that he was lying upon his back at some elevation from the floor. Again the cloudy incubus closed in and he knew no more. When he finally recovered the use of his faculties, it was to discover himself the possessor of a violent headache. The pain came in such fearsome throbs that it was well-nigh unendurable. The lamp still sputtered dimly where the professor had left it. 
At the moment, it was on the point of going out altogether. The reporter noticed this, and over him stole a sense of panic. What if the light should fail altogether, leaving him lying in the dark in this frightful place? Still dizzy and sick, he managed to rise upon his elbows enough to complete a survey of the room. He was still in the laboratory of Professor Kell, but that worthy had disappeared. Of Handlin, there was no sign. The mysterious apparatus, of which he now had but a vague remembrance, also had vanished. His thoughts became confused again, and wearily he passed a hand over his brow in the effort to collect all of his faculties. The lamp began to sputter, arousing him to action. Desperately, he fought against the benumbing sensation that was even again stealing over him. Gradually, he gained the ascendancy. He struggled dizzily to his feet and took a few tentative steps. Where was Handlin? He decided his friend had probably recovered from the drug first and was gone, possibly to get a doctor for him, Perry. However, he must make some search to determine if Skip had really left the premises. As he walked through the open door, the lamp in his hand gave a last despairing flicker and went out. From there, he was forced to grope his way down the dark hall to the stairs. Just how he reached the lower floor, he was never able to remember, for as yet, all the effect of the powerful drug had not worn off. He had a dim recollection of being thankful to the ancestor of Kell who had provided such thick carpets in these halls. Thanks to them, his footsteps had been noiseless at any rate. What was Kell's real object in giving them those drugged cigars, he wondered. How long had they been under the influence of the lethal stuff? Surely several hours. Upon glancing through a hall window, he found that outside was the blackness of midnight. Cautiously, he explored the desolate chambers on the ground floor. The kitchen, where it could be plainly seen that cooking of a sort had been done. The barn and woodshed. Not a living thing could he find, not even the huge wolfhound which had attacked them in so strange a manner that afternoon. By now, he was quite frankly worried on Handlin's account. At that moment, could he have known the actual fate that had overtaken his companion, it is quite probable he would have gone mad. He stumbled back and into the dark front hall, shouting his friend's name. The response was a hollow echo, and once or twice he thought he heard the ghost of a mocking chuckle. At length he gave up the search and started for the door, intent now only upon flight from the accursed place. He would report the whole thing to the office and let Bland do what he pleased about it. Doubtless Handlin had already left. Then he stumbled over Handlin's camera. Evidently the professor had neglected to take possession of it. That must be rescued at all costs. He picked it up and felt the exposed plate still inside. He started again for the door. What little light there was faded out and he felt stealing over him a horrid sensation of weakness. Again came a period of agony during which he felt the grip of unseen forces. Once more it seemed that he was engaged in mortal strife with Skip Handlin. Malevolently Handlin glared at him as he endeavored with all his strength to overcome Perry. This time, however, the latter seemed to have more strength and resisted the attack for what must have been hours. Finally, the other drew away baffled. At this, the mental incubus surrounding Perry's faculties broke. Dimly he became aware of a grinding noise nearby and a constant lurching of his body. At length his vision cleared sufficiently to enable him to discover the cause of the peculiar sensations. He was in a railroad coach. He took a rapid glance around and noted a drummer sitting in the seat across the aisle, staring curiously at him. With an effort, Perry assumed an inscrutable expression and determined to stare the other out of countenance. Reluctantly, the man glanced away, and after a moment, under Perry's stony gaze, he suddenly arose and chose a new seat in front of the car. Perry took to the solace of a cigarette and stared out at the flying telegraph poles. From time to time, he noted familiar landmarks. The train had evidently left Keegan far behind and was already nearly into the hometown. For the balance of the ride, the reporter experienced pure nightmare. The peculiar sensations of dizziness, accompanied by frightful periods of insensibility, kept recurring. Now, however, not lasting more than ten or fifteen minutes at a time. At such times as he was conscious, he found opportunity to wonder in an abstracted sort of way how he had ever managed to get on the train and pay his fare, which must have been a cash one, without arousing the conductor's suspicions. Discovery of a rebate in his pocket proved that he must have done so, however. The business of leaving the train and getting to the office has always been an unknown chapter in Perry's life. He came out of one of his mental fogs to find himself seated in the private editorial sanctum of the journal. Evidently he had just arrived. Bland, a thick-set man with the jaw of a bulldog, was eyeing him intently. Well, any report to make? The question was crisp. The reporter passed a hand across his perspiring forehead. Yes, I guess so. I, uh, that is... You see, where's Handlin? What happened to you? You act as if you were drunk. Bland was not in an amiable mood. Search me, Perry managed to respond. 
If Skip isn't here, old man Kel must have done for him. I came back alone. You what? The irate editor fairly roared, half rising from his chair. Tell me exactly what happened and get ready to go back there on the next train. Or, no, on second thoughts, you'd better go to bed. You look all used up. Hanlon may be dead or dying at this minute. That Kel could do anything. He pressed the button on his desk. Johnny, he said to the office boy, get O'Hara in here on the double quick and tell him to bring along his hat and coat. He turned again to Perry, who was gazing nervously at the door. Now tell me everything that happened and make it fast, he ordered. The reporter complied, omitting nothing except the little matter of his mental lapses at the house of Professor Kellen on the train. The incident of the drugged cigars seemed to interest the old man hugely, and Perry did not forget to play up Handlin's exploits in getting the picture of the professor. All through the recital, he was in a sweat for fear that he might have a recurrence of one of his brain spells and that Bland would become cognizant of it. When would the chief finish and let him escape from the office? Desperately, he fought to prevent the numbing sensation from overcoming him. All that kept him from finally fleeing the place in panic was the entrance of Jimmy O'Hara. Slight, wiry, and efficient-looking, this individual was a specimen of the perfect journal reporter. This is saying a good deal, for the news crew and editorial force of the paper were a carefully selected body of men indeed. Bland never hired a man unless experience had endowed him with some unusual qualification. Most of them could write up a story with realistic exactitude, being able in most cases to supply details gleaned from actual experience in one walk of life or another. Of this redoubtable crew, probably the queerest was Jimmy O'Hara. Jimmy had just finished a sentence in the pen for safe-cracking at the time he landed the job with the journal. Theoretically, all men should have shunned him on account of his jailbird taint. Not so bland. The chief was independent in his ideas on the eternal fitness of things and allowed none of the ordinary conventions of humanity to influence his decisions. So Jimmy became one of the staff and worked hard to justify Bland in hiring him. His former profession gave him valuable sidelights upon crime stories of all kinds, and he was almost invariably picked as the man to write these up for the columns. Jimmy, said the chief, we have need of an experienced strong-arm man and all-around second-story worker. You are the only man on the force who fills the bill for this job. Perry here has just returned from Keegan, where I sent him to interview Professor Kell. Skip Hanlon went with him, but failed to return. We want to know what happened to Skip. That's your job. Get Handlin. If he's dead, let me know by long-distance phone and I'll have a couple of headquarters men down there in a hurry. Get a good fast car and don't waste any time. That's all. O'Hara stopped long enough to get the location of Professor Kell's place fixed in his mind, then abruptly departed. Bland gazed after him musingly. A professor will have some job to put anything over on that bird, he said grimly. Personally, I'm sorry for the old soul. End of section 7